Hi everybody, welcome to this Timeline documentary. My name is Dan Snow and here I am in a Lancaster bomber cockpit, one of the few remaining Lancasters from the Second World War, to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hit, it's like Netflix for history. Hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with many of the world's best historians. Follow the information below this film or just search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. This is the kissing gate of St Kineberger's Church here in the village of Caster in Cambridgeshire. And it's one of the most beautiful medieval churches in England. And yet it's what's under this church's graveyard that's got our archaeologists very excited because beneath my feet could be the remains of a mysterious Roman building. But it's not just one Roman building by itself. Over there in the school playing field, across there in the rectory. In fact, everywhere I look, archaeologists have found impressive Roman structures. This could add up to be something very special. Looks like it's going to be a hectic three days. That is, if I can never get down again. Caster is five miles west of Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. Nearly 2,000 years ago, it was right next to the important Roman town of Dura Brevi and less than a mile from Ermine Street, a major Roman road that's still visible from the air today. And over the last 400 years, antiquarians, archaeologists and even grave diggers have been discovering nuggets of Caster's intriguing past. Ben, you've been here before, haven't you? You're an old friend of William and his grave diggers. Yes, I used to look after the archaeology in this area, so yes, I know William well. <laughs> Why? Why did you keep coming here? Well, every time a grave was dug, a mass of Roman material would come out. So, you know, it, it was obviously of interest and something that I ought to be concerned about. This kind of stuff? Absolutely. I'm, I'm just an enthusiastic amateur, but even I can recognise distinctive Roman material like this, tegula, a piece of Roman tile with its ridge, a piece of pili, Roman hippocorse bricks. What's the stuff you got here? Well, um, about a couple of years ago, the grave diggers called me to say that they thought they'd gone through a Roman building in digging the grave. Now, obviously, I wanted to have a look, and they actually lowered me into the grave, which was, which was pretty unnerving and peculiar. But in the base of the grave, um, it was obvious that they had, in fact, got something like a Roman floor and I could just make out this sort of thin band of, of Roman cement and I would dearly love to know what this was part of. Are you happy about us digging in your graveyard? Absolutely. It, it doesn't seem quite right. No, this area has not been dug in before. There are no bodies buried here. Well, this, this strip along Absolutely. here? Absolutely. Yeah. But even without any graves, Geophys will still need to scan this narrow strip of churchyard before we open any trenches. We're also surveying the playing field of the next door school, as this is where an intriguing 19th century antiquarian said he found some Roman baths. Well, here we are. Ah. He was a man obsessed with Castor's archaeology, and he's buried right here. Sacred to the memory of Edmund Tyrrell Artis, who died the 24th of December, 18... It's been eroded. 47. 47. In the 59th? 59th year of his age. Edmund Artis had a remarkable mix of talents. A chocolate maker and a budding artist, he wangled himself a job working for landed gentry in the Castor area. He then found he had a passion for archaeology and became a one-man time team, digging all over the area, and illustrating his efforts with beautiful drawings. When there are slack periods during the work on the estate, artist borrows labour from the estate and uses it for his excavations into archaeological sites. And obviously he's going to have the blessing of the landowner because, because he works He's for working for him, yes, yes, that's right. Ideal, really. Absolutely, isn't it? yes. yes. Yeah. There are wonderful stories, for example, of him excavating through severe winters. Mm. 
where all the workmen clear off because it's too cold, but leave Edmund Artis digging away to his heart's content. So he was really a driven man, actually. Artis also surveyed the whole village and published this map in 1828. It claims to show the location of lots of Roman buildings in and around the churchyard. But antiquarians, as we know, can be a bit unreliable. So we're going to test just how much of what Artis says is here can actually be found on the ground. There's obviously a lot of commonality between what he mapped and what's still here. What are you doing, guys? Well, what we're trying to do is look at, first of all, what Artis mapped in the early 19th century. And we've overlaid them against the, the modern base map so we can get some idea of where these features were. There are enough common features in there to be able to roughly work out where his buildings were and their orientation and so on. Roman buildings. Roman buildings, yeah. that's right. Now, the problem comes when you add to that this overlay, which is where various bits of what he found have been re-excavated over the years, these bits in, in yellow. Trying to match things together, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just looking at this, I mean, it seems to be more... Well, you match up one side, and the other side's out. You try and match up this side, and this side's all out, so basically, well, it just doesn't match. Mm. <laughs> and this is pretty critical to sort out the orientation and alignment of these walls to understand what's here. Mm. So what are we going to do, Stu? Well, there's only one way to really do that, and that's almost kind of throw away some of this stuff. And draw a new map? Exactly. Create our own map. So you two have got quite a big job, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Stuart and Henry are going to make their own map of Castor and mark on it the precise location of all the known archaeology. A job made easier by the massive chunks of Roman wall still visible in the lanes around the churchyard. And there's another, I can see another large chunk out the corner <laughs> of my eye. That's more like it. And this looks to be part of a wall that was heading sort of in that direction through the, through the churchyard. But the mystery of what lies beneath Castor can only be solved by digging. <laughs> well, don't hold your breath. <laughs> So, ignoring some underwhelming geophys... So what are these coloured blobs along here, then? Mick well, I, I decides it's still worthwhile opening a trench close to where Ben was lowered into that grave. And under the watchful eye of Phil and Rakshar... Little bit of toil. ..our digger gets trench number one underway. See, what we're getting is lots of reflections close to the surface. John's a bit confused. His radar was showing very little here, but we've barely scratched the surface and we've got archaeology. Which, which could be that, but... Then... we just, just forget that? Yeah, I am this forgetting is, it. This is reality. This will tell us whether there's anything there. Is that Roman? Already, pieces of Roman mosaic flooring called tessera are turning up. Yeah, William said you get tesserae in the graves here. Ah, no, what's that? Finally, John figures out where his geophys has gone wrong. We've you got the Roman do... filter on. <laughs> what, you filter the Roman out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that imaginary filter would have to be pretty effective because when Artis first came to Castor, he claimed to have found staggering amounts of Roman archaeology. When Edmund Artis comes here in the 1820s, uh, he refers to walls standing in considerable height. If we look at this, which is a newspaper report from Edmund Artis, uh, 7th of December, 1821. So that's the local paper? That's the local paper, mm. Draycard Stamford News. And the report says, on the north side of the church, five rooms have been discovered, the walls of which are beautifully painted and from 10 to 11 feet high. Wow. But the floors are all destroyed. That's massively high, isn't it? So that's as uh, high as the walls in here, actually. Yeah. Back outside, it's now raining cats and dogs on our archaeologists in Trench One. <laughs> Thank you so much. But despite the weather and the geophys results, this trench is turning into something of a gold mine. We got some finds for. We're getting loads of finds out already. This is just a selection. There's this stuff, which is kind of Saxo-Norman, dates the 11th, early 12th century, around about the time the church was built. So they were quite possibly robbing out the Roman buildings for stone to build the church. And we've got our first bit of early Middle Saxon handmade pottery, five, six, seven centuries, something like that. What about this chunky stuff here? Well, we've got Roman as well. There's some bits of Roman colour-coated pottery, which is late third, fourth. Bit of a mosaic tessera as well, possibly. 
Cracking selection of finds already. It looks like there's something coming out of the trench, Phil. Yeah, well, this is the crucial thing, Tony. As Paul says, we are beginning to get Saxon pottery. These are the first levels that we're actually coming down onto. They could include Saxon buildings here. This is really rather extraordinary for us. We always have a problem finding Saxon on time team. To find it, great, but then to find it on the site where we're looking for Roman is a little bit more difficult. What do we find next? Probably snow. Afternoon of day one here at the fabulous Caster Parish Church in Cambridgeshire where we're looking for what could be some very intriguing Roman buildings. Already Phil's put in a trench over there on the far side of the graveyard and has come up with some Roman stuff but now we've moved on to the old rectory. Stuart, why are we here? Well, it's clear that when artists produced the plan of the site, there were Roman buildings under the rectory garden. And some excavations were conducted in the 1970s, which confirmed little bits of wall through keyhole trenches. So we know this stuff under here. But the problem is, these are only tiny little bits. We don't know whether this range extended further that way or further that way. And if you look at this lovely drawing that was done by artists at the time, this is what he found down here. You see the church? in the background. Yeah, right. you can see that just, just through those trees That's there, it, can't yeah. you? So you can see it's quite a long way down. If we can find some of these features, we can then get the orientation, we can map them and we can add them to that map that we've created of the site to find out if this is one building or a series of buildings. So we're going to open our second trench here in the old rectory garden. And after some promising geophys, we've decided to put a third trench in this corner of the school field. This is another spot that our antiquarian artists and later archaeologists have explored. And it seems to have been an artist's favourite, because he drew the remains of this impressive Roman bathhouse he reckoned he'd found here. One thing about excavating here is that there's something very um, identifiable we can, we can latch onto, we know exactly where we are, but it's never actually been excavated at all in, in that uh, direction, so right. we might get any Roman remains. As we start to get to grips with this site, I'm getting a feeling that there's something special about Castor. Goodies for archaeologists seem almost guaranteed here. This is an amazingly impressive group of finds, isn't it? And all from Peterborough Museum and all found at Castor. That's right, yeah, all from the Castor area. I mean, what's particularly interesting is the collection of pottery here. There's a, a wonderful hunt cup, for example. Uh, so cool because it has greyhounds or mm -hmm. dogs chasing, here it comes, look, the hare. Isn't that a lovely sinuous It's hair. wonderful, isn't yeah. it? Yes. But it's finds like this painted wall plaster that may be the key to unlocking the secrets of Castor. Or oh, this one, look, which appears to have some sort of image of foliage on it, with mm. perhaps leaves being painted. The whole impression is of a really, really opulent building. Really mm. opulent building, yeah. Artist marks lots of structures to the north of the church. Could this be a complex of swanky Roman buildings? If so, our trench in the old rectory garden could be right on top of one. But if Artis's plan is accurate, it's the north graveyard where we really need to focus our efforts. So Jim is now geophysing here. And by mid-afternoon, he's latched onto something. Um, you've turned up just at the right time. Look at this. We've got a really strong reflector here and it's at least five metres across. Well, that's nothing like anything else in the churchyard, is it? No, no, up until now, I mean, there's been the odd reflection, but they've looked like um, they could just be stone casket or a slab-lined grave. But, I mean, this is much, much bigger, and it's about halfway up the slope, just beyond where this mess is. Well, this is where the one building was meant to be from antiquarian records, where they got this early mosaic. It's possible Jimmy's detected this striking Roman yeah. mosaic floor that artists drew in his book of illustrations. And if our antiquarian site plan is to be trusted, it makes sense that geophys are getting a strong signal here. Yeah, it's slow going, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit of a challenge. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to it. Thanks. <laughs> but over in Trench 2 at the old rectory, there's already good Roman evidence turning up. You've got loads of Roman pottery, you've got Roman tile, um, you've even got a tiny bit 
vessel glass. Don't know yeah. where it's come from. Roman as well, yeah? Oh, yeah, it's all Roman, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. And there's a couple of Roman coins as well, which are sort of late third century or thereabouts. I mean, most of the pottery is kind of late third to fourth century. I mean, any time within that span, really. But, I mean, it looks like a primary deposit. It's yeah. stuff that, you know, it's found where it was dropped sort of thing. It may not have travelled far, but I've got an inkling that we might be looking at backfill down here. So, really? Yeah, okay. because uh, the pottery is very well distributed through it. The top of it's very loose. It's very homogenous, thick deposit, so uh, I think we may be looking at where artist dug one of his holes. Really? Mm. So Matt could be onto a posh artist building. But once again, it's chucking it down. Nevertheless, Trace is battling on in the school field, searching for the Roman baths. Trace, is that just a pipe you've got in your trench, or is it a wall? It's neither, Tony. Um, I mean, this trench is turning into a bit of a nightmare at the moment. Why's that? Well, we've got these little pockets of upstanding Roman archaeology, all of these little yellowy orangey patches down there, this stretch here. Um, everywhere else, artists has just dug into it. It, do it doesn't look like I expected it to look, to be honest. I thought it would be more full of walls than it is. That's what I was hoping for as well. It doesn't, not yet, no, no sign of walls as yet. But if it isn't a wall, what is it? I mean, this is looking like demolition material. It may be that this is over the top of something. It certainly has painted wall plaster in it. But if we've got that painted plaster, then we'd know it's Roman. Uh, oh, yeah, and we've got uh, these tiles and stuff, so it looks like it's a bathhouse. Lots and lots of box flue yeah. tiles yeah. coming up, yeah. It may be a mess, but at least it's a Roman mess. None of that nasty Anglo-Saxon stuff. Oh, I like Saxon, though, Tony. <laughs> Not as much as the venerable bead here. <laughs> End of day one. And as the rain at last gives way to sunshine, something's going on behind the church. There must have been something here for them to rob and raid to use. Yeah. What are yeah. you guys doing here, all the excitement, on the far side of the church? You're stuck round the back. Yeah, but we've been looking at all the Roman stuff built into the church, the tile and the stonework and so on, and the idea that it comes from a huge Roman building that's somewhere round here, the back of the church. Artists had a theory that all the Roman buildings to the north of the church were one giant structure. And Stephen thinks this is how it might have looked. Well, it's a pretty enormous building, Tony. I mean, from where we're standing to the far side, it's 110 metres. Crikey. Well, if it's that big, it would absolutely dwarf the church, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It would be three or two or three times bigger than the church. So what could something that size actually be? Let's go back to artists. He called it a praetorium. What's a praetorium? Well, in artists' terms, he were used to digging villas of fairly modest size, and this was the biggest thing that he ever saw and ever dug. And he gave the term praetorium, implying its size. What does it mean? Probably means a headquarters for some state or military function. Have you geophysed this area yet? Yeah, Jimmy's done over half of the graveyard, and to be honest, it's been a nightmare, absolute nightmare with all the graves. It's been one of the most difficult surveys he's done. The problem I've got is what we're not seeing in these results are massive Roman walls, foundations or rooms. The same way we did not this morning, you know, in Phil's trench. If modern technology doesn't see the archaeology that you think may be there, an artist thought may be there, the one thing to do is to, to put a trench oh, and have yeah. a look. Yeah. Can we dig the churchyard? We can dig in this churchyard. Wow. Hey. We've got wow. one day, <laughs> one day, the Das has given a permission, very excited, we need to grab the charm. That's For one day only. One day only. So we've got just a single day to find this mysterious Roman praetorium and not much evidence to go on. We're going to need some luck tomorrow. Beginning of day two here at the Church of St Kineberger in Castor, and today we're faced with a big challenge. We're looking for something that's been called a Praetorium, which is a massive Roman building thought to lie somewhere in this graveyard. But we've only been allowed one day to dig it. And the second problem, and hopefully our osteoarchaeologist Jackie's going to be able to help us with this one, is that nowadays a lot of people feel far more sensitive about the issue of human bones than at almost any other time in history. Mm. So how are we going to respond to those sensitivities? Well, the first thing, obvious thing, is that there's so many greystones around here, we're not going to be able to dig this with a machine. We're going to have to do everything by hand. Now, there's no modern graves here. The only thing we can see is either late 18th or 19th century. So, presumably, there's going to be bones under bones under bones. Exactly, because there's going to be a lot of unmarked graves here. And the other thing is that there will be an awful lot of material that's sort of loose in the soil. 
because in the past it's been disturbed. When they've dug a grave, they will have hit graves that weren't marked and bones will have been disturbed. Disarticulated. Disarticulated bones. They were far more robust about these things in the past as long as they didn't leave the consecrated ground of the graveyard. And yeah. that's one of the things we have to make sure happens here, that everything that we dig out goes back in the ground. Our efforts will be concentrated north of the church because that's where antiquarian Edmund Artis marked a series of mysterious structures. If we can confirm key parts of his plan, then we could be on the way to getting our Praetorium, a very special Roman building. We've only got one day, Ben. Yeah. What do you think our overall strategy should be? Well, I think Artis was a very good archaeologist for his time, but I'm, I'm not so confident about this sort of floating building here. Yeah, is yeah. it attached to the other buildings around it? What alignment is it on? We need a trench across there to try and yeah. tie it to the other buildings and sort out the alignment. Yeah. Then I think we need to do something similar in the west part of the churchyard, just here. Now, a few That's years where you can see that wall in the path. Yeah. Well, yeah. a few years ago, I cleaned up a bit of wall there, and there's definitely something there, but I didn't yeah. get much of a look at no. it. Is that a big building range, as artist depicts it? And I'm off up there now. <laughs> so Phil's on the move. To this spot, just north of the church, to help Jackie dig a new trench in the graveyard. And Rakshar's opening a trench as well, in the area that Ben's interested in. But why, though, might the Romans have chosen this corner of Britain to build a praetorium? From everything we know about this site, it seems to have been in use in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th centuries AD. What else was going on around here at that time? Oh, an awful lot. I mean, it's a very important place in Roman Britain. Is it? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, lo the local Roman town, Durabriva, which is about a kilometre from here, it is immensely important. It's 44 acres within the walled area, but the significance of Durabriva is it's got 400 acres of suburbs with it. Castor was right on the edge of Durabrivae's vast industrial suburbs, an area the size of Roman London. And of course, here we're very close to Ermine Street, aren't we? That, that very important north-south roadway that's become the A1. It's along that route that some of the significant characters of Roman Britain would have passed, people like Hadrian and Constantine. Uh, and Hadrian's particularly important yeah, because of the Fenland. Exactly. I mean, Hadrian was very keen on draining places, and we think that, that he actually oversaw the improvement of the Fens, the drainage of parts of the Fens, or at least works to make it economically productive. So he might actually have come here? Sure, yeah, sure. yes. Oh, absolutely. This no, is no. not somewhere that's insignificant or sort of tucked away. This is somewhere that's sort of at the hub of, of Roman Britain. By the third century, Castor was perfectly placed, with Durabrivae on one side and the imperial Fenland estates on the other. It may have become the centre of an economic boom area, and that could be the reason why a praetorium was built here. Since yesterday evening, we've been using this word praetorium, but quite honestly, I still have no idea what it means. Well, in a sense, Tony, we're lumbered by what artists, or how artists use the term praetorium. I and mean, if we look at his book, he shows, for example, all the villas that he excavated, the ones here and here and here, as comparatively small structures. But look at the size of that structure, which is the praetorium, this building. It's, you know, much, much bigger. So is he just using it to mean a big building? He's, that's exactly right. He's simply saying this is a walloping big building that I don't understand, but it's clearly significant and probably more significant than the surrounding villas. But there are things called Pretoria around the Roman Empire, aren't there? Of course there are, yeah. I mean, they're normally associated with the residences of state officials or even military officials. The truth is, though, we still haven't a clue what's here, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I reluctantly have to admit that that's the case. We know we've got something very big. We know it's surrounded by other Roman buildings, but I suppose a bit like artists, we're still struggling to put it in a sort of context, a framework. We're what, still what looking for clues. Still looking for clues. Meanwhile, down in the school field... And what measurement do we have? Stuart has mysteriously changed into period costume. Six metres sixty. Stuart, you look magnificent. Look at this, look, the, the, the Colin Firth of Time Team. <laughs> What exactly is it, though, that you're doing? 
What we're trying to do is get back into the mindset of artists when he mapped this site in the early 19th century. So you are our artist? Uh, that's me, absolutely. And what I'm going to do is to get myself back into his mindset and the problems he would have had linking all together all these bits of Roman finds and trenches into an existing map. So I'm going to try and do exactly the same with a modern day existing map, but using the equipment that he would have available, something like a plane table, a site rule, probably this magnifying glass I say going a bit, and various bits and bats of surveying equipment to see how easy or how difficult or what problems he would have encountered doing it. But you're not on your own, are you? Hang on a minute. Look at this. <laughs> Here he is, Matt, your long-suffering servant. Sir. The part with which I empathise somewhat. Uh, what are you going to be? Well, all the measuring was done with these chains because we had to use these to measure across the fields and there was lots of running around across the bogs and stuff, so we're basically doing whatever Stuart tells me to do. He's officially my chain man. That is the term that would have been used for, for the role that Matt has. He's going <laughs> to swan around and you're going to do all the hard work. I'm going to be legging it around the fields. <laughs> As Stuart and Matt go to work antiquarian style. Um, another corner, please. Hello, Phil. How's it going? Phil and Jackie are searching for a structure with a mosaic floor that artists claimed was under the graveyard. We do actually have a piece of the floor itself. If you turn that over, you can see that that is actually made of one, two, three, four, five individual tesserae all mortared together. That's the surface that they would have walked on. Right. It looks a nice, nice piece. But we've also got the walls as well, because we've got plaster. wall plaster yeah, in yeah. red and a sort of grey-green mm. as mm. well. So, with a bit of luck, if we carry on down, we should get the floor and, and maybe the, the walls without disturbing, disturbing the greys. That would be a great relief to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> With over 20,000 burials in this churchyard, it's not going to be easy finding any evidence for our praetorium. But in the rectory garden trench, which Faye's now taken over from Matt, we may be onto something. What have you actually got going on over there, Tim? Well, I seem to have this surface. It's got a few tesserae in it, but it's very pebbly and not very good. But you've got archaeology. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely we, archaeology. Now, that's what's interesting, because where I am, I've got nothing. I've got a great big rectangular hole with no archaeology in it, and my only explanation for that can be that this is where artists shoved his trench, and he basically took everything away with him. And therefore, that's why we've got this line along here, which I think is a robbed-out wall. But what I need to do is find a depth for this, because I'm hoping that he may have left something at the bottom, like a hypercore system or something. That would be good. I think there's a fair bit more to do. Yeah. So, some good news. Fay's trench may have a Roman structure, but there's still no sign of these massive walls we're hoping for. Everywhere on this site, we seem to be following in the footsteps of this chap, Artis. Some of us, quite literally. I need some measurements from this line now so I can put them on the drawing. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, beg your pardon. You're on time, Matthew. How? I think the peg's come out. Who put the peg in, Matthew? Sorry, sir, it went up and again. That's your wages, Dot. Yes, Mr Ainsworth. Right, next, the rectory garden next, Matthew. Anything you say, Mr Ainsworth? <laughs> Down at Tracy's Trench, we're working in an area where artists drew this illustration of his Roman bathhouse excavation. So, how have you got on, then, Tracy? Well, we're getting there, I think. Well, you've got walls and things showing yeah. there, which you didn't have before. No, we have, actually. That's lovely. You've got herringbone wall there forming one side and another one on this side, and it's, it's forming a channel running up here to the remnants of this larger wall here. This has been rubbed off, obviously. OK. Well, that all ties in nicely with bathhouses, doesn't it? So. It does. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't quite look like artists' drawing, does it? There's a lot more stonework and stuff mm. there. I think the problem is we don't know how long this was open after artists excavated it out. So you think people came along and nicked it, basically? Local houses, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but, was... but it probably didn't look quite like that when artists discovered it anyway. I mean, I, I doubt very much whether all the walls were this uniform height, for example. Right. All the pillay, again, were this uniform height. I, I think he got large chunks of this and, and has just helped us to sort of visualise the whole. Mm. I, think it, I think there's a slight amount of embellishment going on here. What we've got to do is... So we've got a sizeable bathhouse, 
but we don't yet know the relationship between it and what's up behind the church. Back in the graveyard, Phil and Jackie are up against the clock, digging carefully around lots of human bones. They've now only a few hours left to get down to the floor of a potentially massive Roman structure. We're definitely on the site of a building, but of course what we're encountering as we go down is lots of human remains. Are these individual burials or are they lots of bones on top of each other? Well, we've, we've had a lot of loose bones spread about, turning up all the way across here. But the difference here is, you can see we've got about five skulls all dumped in together in one place. So you do think that that could be a grave digger who's cleared earlier graves, dug a pit, chucked these in so that more people can be buried? Yeah, I mean, basically, it looks like a charnel pit. But we do have a problem, don't we, that we've got lots of bones and lots of smashed mosaic but no structures whatsoever. What we can be certain of is that in places, the grave diggers have been through the Roman floor. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this sort of material. What we've got to hope is that they didn't destroy it all and that they've left some of it for us. And that means digging deeper? That means digging deeper. Thankfully, Rakshar's trench at the western end of the graveyard looks to have got something more substantial. Oh, How's it going? It's going very well, actually. Um, put this trench in here to find what we thought was a wall coming through yeah. there. And uh, lo and behold, we have a huge wall. <laughs> that was actually poking out of the ground before it was, you started, it was, wasn't we it? We knew that was there, <laughs> but I didn't realise how massive it actually is. So we've got one wall here, mm -hmm. which is in running in that direction. And then where John is, we have the return, and that's running in this direction. So they should actually come out and converge around about here. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the first time that we have seen anything like the kind of monumental walls that Edmund Artis saw. Yeah, this is the, this is the only trench where we actually have huge walls. Mm, mm. And it's our failure so far to find other big walls that's becoming a major concern. For all the wonderful Roman buildings artists said were here, we haven't actually found much yet. Yeah. Matt, this is a turn up for the books. We usually put you through about 24 hours of hell in these reenactments, but it's only been three and you're practically finished. Well, I mean, once we've got a system going between us, rolling out the chains and back again, it really, really didn't take very long at all. And what have you found out? <laughs> well, we've got, what, one, two, three, four, five trenches open. We've got some bits of wall line exposed where the roads cut through. What we actually found out is that we haven't got very many walls at all. And if you look at what, we've, what we actually know about this site from modern methods, these excavations in the 70s and so on, these are the only bits in black where bits of wall have been found. So yeah, how, do you, how do you join all those together? It's actually extremely difficult. We're having to rely an awful lot on what artists put on his plans and what he drew. I imagine that very soon we would be able to paint this incredibly large Roman building <laughs> just behind us, but mm. I'm just starting to have my doubts. Mm. It's beginning to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, on our Praetorium diagram, we're only certain of the black bits. All the other colours depend on our antiquarian's observations. So, how reliable do we now think he is? One very interesting thing to point out here with this wall line that artists mapped, it's completely in different orientation to everything else, which raises a doubt about the orientation of some of this theoretical stuff. What about GFIs? Have these lines been looked at? Yeah, well, John and his team have, have done GFIs and radar in all this area in here, and there's no other additional big wall lines to add to that. So. Yeah, I can be extremely sceptical about the work of antiquarians. It's not always what it's cracked up to be. I don't think that's fair in the case of artists. I will defend him to the hilt in some places. I mean, look, he's a fantastic draftsman. His plans are in some cases backed up by beautiful general views and the details of where the walls go yeah. always match the relevant plan, especially as these red artist walls have often been confirmed by more modern excavation. But I'd these are OK. I'd endorse that as well, having mapped this village and where mm. he shows them on here in the similar techniques and you come up with similar answers in where he's yeah. positioned them. He's a good surveyor. And, yeah. and, and yeah. we've got it down in the bathhouse at the bottom. We've got his plan and we're beginning to find the walls. All right, yeah. say this red stuff is right, Ben, but there's still a lot of other colours here. Well, I saw a wall fragment here as well. And, OK, it was only part of a wall, but it was a whacking great wall. And the Romans didn't build bits of whacking great walls for no reason. This substantial wall must be part of a bigger building. So on 
one hand, we've got this mega building which should be casting its long shadow over us right now. And on the other hand, as far as things that we can actually 100% guarantee, we've got that. And we've got just one day left. Got some work tomorrow, guys. Beginning of our final day here at Castor in Cambridgeshire and we've just had some fantastic news. The diocese have given us permission to dig in the graveyard down there for one final day. Although whether we'll find our big Roman building, the Praetorium, is a huge question. So we're spreading our bets today. In the old rectory garden, where we're looking for what could be the east wing of our Praetorium, we now have two trenches. But our main hopes lie with these trenches in the graveyard. Rakshars at the western edge and Phil's just north of the church. Beneath these bones, we're trying to find this Roman structure, marked as F on the plan that artists drew. It's here that he said he found a brightly coloured mosaic floor. Phil, you know how I said I was getting a lot more building material and big blocks of tessera? Oh, wow. Now I'm getting lots of pea grit, which is coming, this fine grit, and look what it's coming down onto. Oh, good lord. That looks like a floor. It looks very like a floor. And this is an in situ burial. That's lying directly on top of it by the look of it. <laughs> oh, that is good stuff. And I'll tell you what. Blimey. We could be just inches away from finally getting evidence of a big Roman structure. And crucially, it's slap bang in the middle of our Praetorian plan. Back in the old rectory garden, Faye's getting really stuck in. And the sweat and graft is starting to pay off. Hi there, Faye. Cool, Hiya. this looks a bit different to yes. yesterday. You're well down. I am, but fantastically, we've got a huge, great big section of it's wall. It's a big Roman wall, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, without a shadow. Without... And we were a bit worried yesterday about the sort of relative heights of all this. I mean, there's a, there's a surface very much higher than the Roman wall. You can see where artist put his trench, which is basically this line down in this section here. And I actually think that level there is where he was standing. <laughs> really? Yeah, which is why it's so compact. With footprints? Human, what size boots did he have? Come You're on, so come demanding. on. so demanding. I haven't got any <laughs> footprints in there. This is a wonderfully complex trench, isn't it? We can see where Artis was actually digging for the first time and try and sort of understand how he unpicked the site and how he, he saw it, yeah, basically. Yeah, that's right. So this is actually a fascinating trench. And it's also a very significant chunk of walling on the eastern side of what we think is one single enormous building. Faye's discovery of this massive Roman wall, previously dug by artists, is a really good sign. Maybe we can rely on our antiquarian after all. Meanwhile, there's breaking news from the graveyard. We've spent the last 36 hours poking around in this graveyard, trying to get permissions to dig it, getting permissions to dig it, then finding nothing but Roman rubble and a tumble of old bones. But at last, Phil, we've got something exciting, haven't we? We have got Artis's floor. Look, if you look down between that pair of legs, you can see a mosaic floor actually in situ. You're smiling, William. I'm really excited about this. If artists are right about this, he might be right about the Praetorium. <laughs> Yesterday, I think you were a little bit disappointed with the attitude of some of our archaeologists who were slightly rubbishing the idea. Well, I was, because Praetorium means a lot to a parson. You know, I've got my Greek New Testament here. The word is used. Show me. Right. Here we are. They took Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, esto Praetorium, to the Praetorium. In Arsis' day, he would have heard the word praetorium when he went to church because that was the word used to describe um, where Jesus was arraigned in front of Pontius Pilate. So he was tried in the praetorium? In the praetorium. But, a, go on. I was going to say, this is so important to what we're trying to do. We've now got the floor. You can actually begin to see some sort of an alignment on the tessery. We might be able to actually say exactly what the alignment of that building was. But it tells us more than just the alignment, doesn't it, William? The scale of the thing, which he insisted, was a praetorium, a big, official, palatial type of building. Finally, our efforts in the graveyard are being rewarded. If you take off the more conjectural parts... And the work of mapping our site is nearly done too. 
Everything we've looked at so far has been on, on a flat plan, hasn't it? Yeah. I can see here you've had a new dimension. What, what are you actually trying to do? Well, what, what I thought I'd do is, is add, add that... Henry's 3D map of our Praetorium is still partly based on conjecture, but there's one feature that stands out. We're on the edge of a valley slope here, aren't we? The, bu the yeah. buildings and structures are on the, the skyline up there, and the bathhouse is down on the lower slopes towards the river below. That's it. And if you were approaching the site from, from down here, then whatever was up on the hill, whether it be one big structure or lots of other structures, it's actually on the skyline. It would actually be quite yeah. impressive, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, whatever's up there is going to be really visually stunning. Back outside in our other graveyard trench, Rakshar's found something stunning as well. Raksha, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> this is fantastic. It looks a lot different than it did yesterday. It, it, it is. It's a lot, lot different. Raksha's revealed a huge section of wall and a step foundation. The classic herringbone style shows that this is definitely Roman. People were a bit sceptical yesterday. I talked about finding this big herringbone wall and I, I suspect that people didn't quite believe me. <laughs> we did kind of think that you were going slightly crazy yesterday, <laughs> but uh, just to prove that you were right, as always, um, we carried on down and, and lo and behold, here it is. As you can see, there's this huge wall coming through. We have this step foundation. So what does this tell us, Ben, about the significance of the whole building? Does it add to our picture of the building? Well, this looks remarkably similar to what was found on the other side of the church in the 50s. Yes, I remember that. I've seen photographs of yeah. it. Yeah, it's on a similar line, and he found step foundations like this. This is a photo of those step foundations excavated at Castor in the 1950s. They're more than 100 metres away from our trench, but they're virtually identical to those found by Rakshar. So I think we're looking at something that was constructed at the same time, basically. And probably the same building, one large building rather than several separate well, buildings. Well, you have to say, same construction techniques on a similar sort of line. Matching dimensions. Exactly. So suddenly we've got two bits of building, both of which have steps and both of which we think align mm. on this slope. So again, <laughs> that's pretty exciting stuff. To think we've been walking across the floor of a Roman building that's been here for nearly 2,000 years is just astonishing. And as the last few hours of our dig at Castor tick by, the news just gets better and better. So what's the story of this trench then, Faye? Basically, we have a Roman building, and actually down there we've got a room with what looks like a hypercore system. So is this stuff that artists found that we've confirmed? Well, artists did map on some walls, and he did suggest there was a hypercore system there, but the locations of the walls and the size of the walls aren't entirely right. Right, so this is new, in fact. Yeah, it is. And what's also new is we've got that, that higher level up there. We've actually got a two-level building. So what did they do? Fill it in or cover it up and then build something on top? Or they had stairs that took you up to another room. Ah, right, right, right. A building on two levels makes sense, because the Romans had to factor in the slope of a hill here in the old rectory garden and on the western side of the church. Down at Tracy's Trench to the south, our excavation of the Roman baths is coming to an end, and the finds are telling a good story. Well, uh, I've got a, couple, a selection of finds here. Uh, this one's from Tracy's Trench, right down the south end of the site, and this is uh, some of the stuff that's been coming out of Faye's Trench, which is right up at the north end of the site. Mm -hmm. Now, the stuff from Tracy's Trench, I'm afraid, to me, looks like generic issue Roman pottery, so no, I think nothing. Steve's Let's probably to better to ask than me on this subject, I think. I'm just going to kick you, actually. That's, that's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> well, there are differences, Helen, quite marked differences, actually. And the bulk of the material from this trench comes from uh, an earlier period, second into third, like this large sherd here, and these are sherds of beakers, very typically local beakers. And it makes a real contrast from the southern part of the site to the northern part of the site, where you've got essentially a third and fourth century assemblage. So Castor has two clear Roman phases, which means the baths at the south end of the site were almost certainly built at an earlier date than the big building up on the hill, where Phil's now finished in the graveyard. You've got to be pleased with that mosaic. 
Yeah, I reckon I am, Tony, but I think I'm probably more pleased about the probable war. What war? We haven't got a war. <laughs> you know, you can't actually see the war, but you see those disarticulated pieces of bone down there? Well, when I actually got down to the edge here, I thought to myself, I wonder if it could be a Rob war. So I thought to myself, ah, I'll get Henry to plot out the position that Artis is building on the ground from the mapping. So that's what he's done. One corner of the building, probable building, is over there. See that red peg's over there? Here? Yeah. That's one corner there. Yeah. And then you see those red pegs there between the, uh, the two gravestones over there? It's truth, all the way well, over here. Have them run. Yeah, go and on. all this is, is one building. Now then, when you line up over there, Give or take a metre, allowing for the scale, yeah. it puts the wall line straight through here. Not only that, the alignment of the tessery is just slightly skewed round to the alignment of the church. And that's exactly what the tessery and the plan do, exactly the same. Yeah. So, regardless of what might be elsewhere, we know that there was a massive construction here, so it looks as though artist was right after all. Oh, well, it looks like it, doesn't it, from what we can see, yeah, yeah. After a roller coaster three days here at Castor, just what have we learned? Ben, how do you think the Praetorium theory is holding up now? Pretty well. It's not a villa. Villas are surrounded by farming estates. They've got ancillary buildings, they've got farm buildings, barns, workers' housing. There's nothing like that here. What else is it? It's a grand, grand building. What do we think this building was for? Well, again, let's just return to Edmund Artis. He first termed it a praetorium, which would mean to him an official residence, perhaps of an official linked with the state, and that's exactly what it is. How do you feel about Artis now? Well, Artis and his plans still live. Yeah, that's... Ab absolutely. They're, where we have tested his plans, we found them to be right. And the other w wonderful thing is, of course, they're very, very beautiful. Yeah. His, his impressions, his general views are, are gorgeous. They're pretty as well as being informative. Everybody likes something to be pretty as well as functional. <laughs> like my hat. <laughs> <laughs> The massive Roman wall that Rakshar found at the western end of the graveyard, nearly two metres wide, was built to support a building possibly three storeys high. And at an extraordinary 110 metres in length, this is the largest Roman building Time Team has ever excavated. It would have had a vast red-tiled roof and bright whitewashed walls. A truly astonishing structure. Mick, I can't remember another dig quite like this one. It's been fantastic to be able to dig in the churchyard, hasn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Three days ago, I don't think any of us can have dreamt of what we got. Absolutely not. And this is so exciting to find this mosaic here underneath these bodies. We've got artists telling the truth. It's a real thing. The Praetorium exists, in my view. <laughs> I'm quite happy Wonderful. With it. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely.